He did not overlook the fact that war is only a continuation of policy by other means, to use this phrase. But he stressed that, and these are his words, the art of war in general, and the commander himself in particular, have a right to demand that the object aimed at by policy shall not be incompatible with the means at disposal, and that in a war which is from the first recognized as being a life or death fight to a finish, the whole resources of the nation must at once be mobilized, that, these must be, that there must be no fear about hitting too hard, and that the only warrantful fear is one of not being able to hit hard enough. Pilcher went on to highlight what Klaus had said of combat. The decision of a great battle is the sum of the decisions of the many small fights of which a great battle is composed. He, that is Clausewitz, also says that a great general action is more often fought on its own account than in any other description of battle, and that its object is even more the destruction of the enemy's moral than of his physical forces. Clausewitz further very much emphasizes what is known to every soldier, namely that during a battle, there is not, as a rule, much difference between the losses sustained by the victor and those sustained by the vanquished, and that a vigorous pursuit is absolutely essential in order to reap the harvest of victory. So Pilcher stressed how the tactical conditions of battle have been changed since Clausius is dead, but he began to recognize in a way that most commentators on the First World War who, who have used Clausewitz as a critical guide have not, that the value of Clausewitz's insights about the First World War derive in the first place from what he has to say about tactics, and then consequence of tactics for strategy, and only ultimately for their impact on policy, rather than on today's normative notion so pervasive in almost everything that is said about Clausewitz that war ought to be subordinated to policy. For example, in commenting on, in, uh, uh, on, on War Book Two, which is the book on the theory of war, Pilcher remarked of the readiness of both Napoleon and the Austrians to sign a peace at Campo Formio in 1797. He says, this applies especially to our times, that is 1917 when he was writing, for the drain on the resources in a war between well-matched antagonists, which is fought to a finish, is so great that unless the stake at issue be of absolutely vital importance, a compromise is usually arrived at. <coughs> what he has said is that the character of the war determines the policy to be pursued. And if the character of the war is leading to indecision, then the consequence will be a negotiated settlement. Now what I want to do, armed with that insight, Klaus is his point, that the greatest task faced at the outset of a war is to identify correctly the character of the war in hand. What I want to do now is look again at Clausewitz's text, and let us begin with where Pilcher ended, with Book 4 of On War, that on combat, which lies at the literal heart of On War. What usually happens in, ma in a major battle today, Clausewitz asks. His answer rests on two assumptions, both as applicable to the First World War as to his own day. The first assumption is that armies were what today we would call symmetrical, so comparable in organization that they effectively canceled each other out at the tactical level. And the second assumption was that war was pursued for great national interests and so followed what Clausewitz called its natural course. In other words, policy was less likely to constrain war than to enable its escalation. Because if the cause was great enough, then the natural quality of escalation within war itself would also be sustained by what politicians felt they had to do. The battles which follow in such circumstances, as it says, are characterized by a prolonged firefight, interrupted by minor blows, these are Clausewitz's words, charges, bayonets, assaults, and cavalry attacks, which cause the fighting to sway to some extent to and fro. Gradually, the units are burnt out. When nothing is left but cinders, they are withdrawn and others take their place. 
So the battle smoles away like damp gunpowder. Darkness brings it to a halt. No one can see, and no one cares to trust himself to chance. The time has come to reckon up how much in the way of service or troops is left on either side. Troops, that is, which are not burned out like dead volcanoes. According to Clausewitz, the outcome of such a battle is not determined by tactical maneuver. Instead, it is based on three constituent signs. First, the psychological effect, particularly in the minds of the commander. Second, the wasting away, as he put it, of one's own troops, which can be accurately calculated because the tempo of the battle is deliberate and seldom very tumultuous, a description obviously immediately applicable to the First World War, and thirdly, by the loss of ground. In Book 6, Down on Defence, Chapter 27, Klaus has discussed the relationship between the loss of men and the loss of ground. Because the loss of men will lead to the loss of ground, but the loss of ground does not necessarily lead to the loss of men. And because of that, it follows that it is always more important to preserve, or as the case may be, to destroy armed forces than to hold on to territory. Here was the classic dilemma for the general of the First World War, manifested in the debate as to whether it was better to hold on to territory and risk greater loss of life, or to save lives by pulling back to a better position. Clausewitz provided a description of an attritional battle in terms which are extraordinarily evocative for historians of the First World War. And that evocative description can be reinforced particularly by the comments in Book 6, that on defence, and Book 7, that on the attack. In Book 7, that on the offensive, Clausewitz warns that a well-prepared, well-manned, and well-defended entrenchment was generally be considered an impregnable point. And he went on to warn that those on the offensive should only resort to the attack of such a position in exceptional circumstances. As he had pointed out in Book 6, that on the defence, the defender enjoys enormous advantages. The defender, he wrote, waits for the attack in position, having chosen a suitable area and prepared it, which means he has carefully reconnoitred it erected solid defences at some of the most important points, established and open communications, sighted his batteries, fortified some villages, selected covered areas, and so forth. The strength of his great front, the, sorry, the strength of his front, access to which is barred by one or more parallel trenches or other obstacles, or by dominant strong points, makes it possible for him, while the forces at the points of actual contact are destroying each other, to inflict heavy losses on the enemy at low cost to himself as the attack passes through the successive stages of resistance until it reaches the heart of the position. The points of support on which his flanks rest secure, secure him against sudden attacks from several directions. The covered ground on which the defender has taken up his position will make the attack wary, even timid. It will enable the defender to slow down the general retrograde movement by means of small successful counterattacks as the area of action steadily narrows. In this way, the defender can confidently survey the battle as it smoulders before his eyes. In Clausewitz's view, the only vulnerability from which the defender suffered in such circumstances lay on his flanks. He assumed, as the generals of 1914 would have assumed, that such defensive positions could be turned. But he also recognised that in strategic terms as opposed to tactical terms, the defence could rest on flanks which provide absolute security. Where the line of defense runs, as he put it, from sea to sea, although of course in 1914 it would be from sea to mountains, or from neutral country to neutral country. 